Yeah, so as Richard said, my name is Philip Rose. Um, I'm a design associate at Spears & Major, um, and we're a lighting design or a, a company um, based in London and in Edinburgh. Um, so and I was pleased to be invited to give a talk on the actual approach and the lighting that we've been doing for the Oxford Brooks redevelopment of this, uh, the Gypsy Lane campus. So um, as a lighting designer, we look at light in a number of different ways and we have a lot of influences. And this basically just an image of light. We see it constantly changing. Um, it comes from many different sources, whether it's natural or artificial. We also think about lighting and it constantly changes from day to night, from th throughout the night, through different times of the day, whether it is by use of artificial light or by natural light. This is obviously an image of the city of London and it's constantly a changing um, environment that we live in. We're also, as a lighting designer, very, very interested in darkness. It complements light and if we only had light, it would be um, very poorly, um, it, it affects our health. So actually darkness is a very important thing and it actually allows us to highlight things, to create contrast and reveal texture, color and everything else. We also look at history and look at what come, has come before, not only in um, the way that people thought about light, most of the time in historical terms, it was always done as a religious um, premise, but obviously we look at the history and the technology that has been available, whether it's just through firelight, going through into oil, and then going into the modern artificial light sources, such as um, fluorescent, and now the advent of LED. Architecture influences how we light buildings, and actually the, we light buildings so that we can actually help reveal the architecture. The use of colour is very important, whether it is using colour to just reveal a, um, a material, um, just to highlight something. It's just a very intrinsic part of our life. The natural light is actually made up of a spectrum of seven colours, and we can see all of them. Um, when they're blended, you end up with the white light source. Um, we're very, very interested in art and light art and how that can affect your uh, perception of things. Obviously, this is a, a, a light sculpture. We're also interested in theatre and actually how theatre can actually, uh, or theatre techniques can actually influence the architectural environment that we work in. Technology, it's constantly changing and we need to be kept up to date with the latest technologies. Obviously, we're going through a fundamental change at the moment within the lighting industry because the EU and regulation brought on by the advent of energy efficiency is pushing us down certain routes and looking at the most energy efficient light sources that we can have. And actually, they're phasing out and banning some of the older technologies, such as the normal light bulb that you have in your house. Soon, you won't be able to buy them or that version of them. This is an image of a, a technology called OLED, which is organic light emitting diode, which is meant to be an illuminated panel of light. Um, light is all about vision. Without it, especially at night, we can't see. However, the eye is very, very adaptable. And actually, we can see in very low levels of light. We can see in, uh, in a dark, uh, nighttime environment and you can actually see your eye can actually adapt to see in what's known as one lux of light so it is very low but it is all about what we can see how we perce perceive a space understanding the legibility of a city or even a room and perception light can transform our perception uh, perception of a space it can blur boundaries it can actually um, heighten or define those boundaries. So that's something that we do need to look at and how that has an impact on the approach that we take. And people. Light is for people. Without it, most of our nighttime activity wouldn't happen. And it is, all, it is about a social interaction with um, other people. I'll just run through a few 
profile, a profile of us and some of the projects that we do, because we do a very wide, varied um, uh, type of lighting. We look at public buildings. This is Burlington Arcade in London, which has just been refurbished. Large infrastructure projects, um, such as airports, railway stations. This is the new Gibraltar Airport. Um, we've luck been lucky enough to work on a number of airports, including Terminal 5 at Heathrow, Terminal 3 at Be uh, Beijing, and um, this is a new one that we completed last year. Landmarks. Um, some people think it's quite frivolous, but actually we understand cities and spaces uh, and towns by the illumination of landmarks. This was a... Um, concrete factory that we did for the Olympics, um, which actually uh, demarcated the entrance for the VIPs. We look at heritage projects, so we look at how we can um, define or reveal the historic fabric of historic buildings, such as the Granary Building for the University of Arts up in King's Cross. We've also had the pleasure of working on things like St Paul's Cathedral and other um, religious buildings. We also get involved in public round projects, um, and they are basically looking at how we light an urban environment. So it's looking at how we can light the streets, how we can make them much more legible after dark. So the definition of walls and vertical surfaces, the highlighting of trees, um, actually helps you understand the space that you're in. We also work on master plans. And this is the uh, one that we're working on in Helsinki, which came out of a competition where we actually look at the macro scale of lighting and how that can impact a city. So um, going through. And then we also get involved in events. Um, and we were luckily enough to be invited to the uh, London School of Economics Urban Age Electric City Conference. And not only did we talk, we actually... Um, dressed the space and actually looked at the theatrical lighting and looked at how the, the space would be um, presented to the actual audience. So looking at this project, or the, the new campus, we've been involved in the project since uh, 2009, when we were brought on board by the architects, um, where they discussed the idea with the client that they needed a lighting specialist actually look at the overall campus to create a high quality um, uh, e uh, environment for the students and also for the visitors. I mean our scope was very broad reaching. We looked at not only the external appearance but a lot of the landscaped areas so the entrance plaza, the central courtyard and the western, western courtyard and also the, um, the routes through it and then obviously we started looking at the interiors so all of the new build, so from the foreign area and the library, reception areas, the teaching spaces, circulation, and going down to the food hall, cafe, and also the student union areas as well. We looked at a number of issues, or what we thought were the issues for the project. And we, looked, we split them into two halves. We looked at the ex what were the issues for the exterior or the external lighting, and then also we looked again for the interior. So some of the issues that we thought was actually the context. The context of the Oxford Brooks within the city, um, the city is not in the centre, it's not really in the historic area, it's actually within um, Headington, it's a sort of adjacent to the 1950s, 60s building that was originally built. So it's actually looking at how the lighting would be appropriate for a sort of semi-urban environment with a lot of parkland around it so that it wouldn't become very dominant or light polluting. We needed to consider a movement. A university is constantly made up of move, um, journeys, whether they're on foot, bicycle or by car and also throughout the, uh, throughout the actual building. You're constantly moving from one space to another. So that we needed to consider that how the lighting could respond to those, uh, those journeys. 
we also consider legibility. What we mean by legibility is by day you can understand the space that you're in, you can see the boundaries, you can see the paths going through it, or you can, or the routes. After dark, your perception of those spaces completely changed. So the idea that the lighting actually responds to the legibility of a space by the lighting of vertical surfaces or objects within the space clearly defining pathways through them actually helps you understand the space that you're in. And we also thought we, that the external lighting needed to create character and understanding the different characters of the, ex, uh, the campus. Obviously, you have a rather large formal uh, entrance plaza and then you have a, two smaller courtyards um, very much more relating to the student population. So we had to create an appropriate character for each of those whilst maintaining a safe and secure environment for you. So what were the influences that um, took our way, um, developed our lighting concepts? Well, we were looking at the, the concepts with the architect and we saw that there was a number of elements or things that you would have to do when you get into the building, the thresholds, whether you're coming from the public space from Headington Road, you cross the threshold into the actual, um, onto the piazza, and then obviously then you go through a threshold into the building. So there is a series of gateways or thresholds that we thought were actually quite important, and actually how could we demarcate those with light? Routes, how can we define a route? Very simply, you could just use street lighting or a column. You could put. Um, so what we looked at is how we could do a, um, define these routes creatively, whether it's simple down lighting or definition of a route by the up lighting of um, a canopy above. Also, landscape. It's important that we light some landscape, not everything because it helps you understand the space that you're in. It also creates an inviting environment for visitors and you to look at. And then what were the opportunities for art? We knew that the, um, we knew that the university was interested in art. And we also thought that there was a number of areas where art could, whether there were light art pieces or art that could be lit, actually could create a very um, important um, part of the overall picture for the external lighting. However, the issues for the interior, most of them are actually the same, but one of the biggest differences was flexibility. We needed to make a lot of these spaces flexible so that they can actually respond to how they are being used by the students, whether it's a big event within the actual forum space, um, how they adjust to lectures, how do they adjust to the teaching of the, uh, going on within them. Again, movement, it's a clear definition of routes through a university. Universities, unless you know them, can actually be quite confusing and you end up re relying on wayfinding. The lighting of, clear lighting of routes could actually help with the wayfinding, uh, assist you with wayfinding in a way that actually you can make your way through these spaces and understanding legibility. So it's the definition of vertical surfaces that you can actually define the space that you're in and actually help you um, with your uh, wayfinding. So what we're looking at when we're doing um, the building is actually looking at the lighting of stair cores and different things so that actually you can see where you need to go. And then again, creating character in a number of the spaces, especially the key public spaces such as the forum, the lecture theatre, the food hall, and then the um, student union areas. So influences within the actual interior lighting were form. We need to understand the spaces that we're in. Some of these spaces are actually quite complex, three-dimensional spaces with lots of things coming in and out of them, especially in the main building where you've got the library, the lecture theatre, a lot of changes of level. So what we need to do is actually look at how the lighting can help reveal that form and allow you to understand it. Creating the appropriate lighting for the function so that it allow you to do what you need to do, whether it's work in a classroom or a teaching room, work quietly in the library, but have the sufficient 
and appropriate lights for that um, function. Identity. Look at how lighting can actually reinforce the identity of different areas, whether it's how, um, just to highlight certain spaces, just uh, the use of different lighting techniques will give it, uh, along with the furnishings, give it an identity. And again, scale. What we find, and especially on these big complex buildings, are the issue with scale. Actually, lighting needs to help bring a human scale into these spaces, whether it's something very small in the spotlighting of some flowers or something very large. And actually, it's to try and bring back that human scale back into the building. Design criteria. This is something, as a lighting designer, we have to consider. All of these things make up part of the design process. Not one of them we can drop, and it sort of changes at times. Some projects are much more image-led, especially when you're lighting of a landmark. But we need to consider all of them at different times. And a project like this, actually, it was an overall thing. So it was to do with the buildability, the cost, making sure we were safe and secure, making sure that the, light, the lighting provided a, an accessible um, environment for people with um, uh, disabilities, but also creating the right image for the building and also for the university so that it can portray um, its brand to the wider public. I mean, our design process is very similar to the architects. We work very closely with them and also with the engineers. However, we um, simplify our process a little bit. We normally do it in four stages, and that includes des uh, concept design, design development, and then detailed design, and then construction and commissioning. Different, we spend different amounts of time at different level, uh, at different phases, and they will work through as we go through the project. So looking at concept design, this is when we work very closely with the architect, understand the brief from them, understand the client's brief, and actually try and develop some ideas and looking at the overall space. Oxford Brooks, whilst it's a large project, there are a lot of areas that require quite a lot of um, simple ideas. And also, basically, there's a lot of spaces that are repetitious. So actually, once you look at it, it's not a particularly complicated building. You just need to come at it at the right mindset. So looking at the, um, looking at the overall campus, um, we were looking at the, the new build only and not the, um, ex the existing uh, Abercrombie building. But how we describe light is quite difficult and actually how we portray it in presentations is also quite a difficult one. Because lighting is quite ephemeral, it's very hard to represent. Um, we talk about it quite often as a series of layers. And I'll just run through how we presented the, cl uh, the lighting to the client. Um, when we were presenting our concept. And I'll just run through how we built it up um, quite shortly uh, for the entrance plaza. And we quite often start off in plan, um, but also we quite often develop it in section, depending on the space that we're in. And also we quite often develop it on a 3D model. But what we try and do is give a, the client a representation of the idea of the light. We never try and get photorealistic because one of the things we find is that if we hold up an image saying it's going to look like that and it doesn't at the end, we get told off by the client and they're not happy. So basically, we looked at, on the entrance plaza, we looked at what was already there. We knew that there was going to be street lighting going down Headington Road. Then we've also got the glow from the buildings. So this is the main entrance plaza. We know that there's colonnade building, and then there's going to be the new library building, and then all the other surrounding buildings will have a presence and actually have an influence on the, the actual piazza itself. Um, as you can see, we also try and reference the images, uh, reference each of the elements with an image so that the client get an idea of what we're doing. Then we talk about the, uh, this is the colonnade going up against the um, uh, colonnade building up to the, define the main entrance. Then we've got the north-south park that runs at path that runs across the site. And that's going to be a public, foot, uh, well, 
got public access across there, so that we needed to maintain that as a safe and secure environment. And then we've got to define changes in level so that nobody falls over and trips. So they actually they need to be defined, whether they're step lighting, we're using handrail lighting, I think, on the project. The definition of trees and the highlighting of them. Um, We've not done everything, but we're trying to um, look at the two key trees to demarcate the entrance to the site. And then we were looking at the sort of tree groups within the steps. Then we looked at art and also whether we could incorporate lighting into benches and different things, just to give it some definition so the space didn't feel completely empty and void. And one of the other th the approaches that we did talk to the client about is whilst it's a big area, and we're defining routes across it, we felt that there was enough space and it would um, to allow the centre of the piazza to go dark. One of the things that we keep saying to the client is don't overlight things, is actually provide safe routes across it. People will go across the square if they feel safe. If there's lots of people there, they will feel safe and go across it. Otherwise, there are defined lit routes that will actually allow you to enter the building safely. We also look at it in section, so we try and describe the lighting, uh, lighting in section. This is a, a, through the piazza, so it picks up the change in level. Um, so looking at the sort of colonnade building and trying to put the, um, the ribbon or the, um, the core steel uh, facade into silhouette against the actual house centre and um, shops. And then we talk about, we do quite quick visuals. So this is the entrance plaza, trying to pick up the um, idea that the building is actually a fully glazed building, whilst it's got lots of texture and different things which will get revealed by night. It's actually the interior lighting that actually gives this building its nighttime appearance. Looking at the central courtyard, um, I'll just run through it. We are looking at, obviously, we've got the glow from the built surrounding buildings. We've got this main sort of portal area as you come in from the um, main piazza. The original idea was to try and reinforce this threshold condition where the architect is using green glass by looking at uh, using coloured uh, coloured light in that area. Um, but through the design development, it was found not appropriate. We're lighting the steps and pathways through the gardens, um, the lighting of trees, and we're looking at two different techniques, one from high level and then also lighting from below um, on some of the trees and then uh, originally the benches were going to be illuminated but I think through uh, the development of the project the benches aren't anymore but um, as you can see things do change from the way that you actually present things. So again section through the space as you can see this is the extension to Abercrombie so the impact of the, off um, the studios and offices behind will have an impact or give the, the part of the character to the actual um, courtyard. You've then got the uh, gallery space at level zero and the um, glass tank. And then we're looking at highlighting the tree to the uh, right from high level so that we've got some fixtures mounted onto the actual building um, just to spotlight those trees. And again, looking at the main reception, uh, sorry, the main forum building and then the uh, lecture theatre. So the idea was that we can see straight through. So whatever we do in there needed to be considered. So again, quick visuals. As you can see, we use a lot of sketches, a lot of hand-drawn, a lot of Photoshop. Um, we never do full-on uh, 3D visuals. Um, and I think one of the the, the reasons we do it is to give the, the evoke the ambience of the lighting, but not actually give them a true representation. So the Western Courtyard, this is going to be more of the student, student area. So again, the glow from the buildings, the highlighting of paths and routes. You've got an upper terrace, uh, so we had to define that edge so that, you wouldn't, um, so that you knew where it was. The lighting of trees and planters and then again we were looking at light art as well or an opportunity for light art um, we were looking at possibly developing ideas along the lines with um, of Jenny Holzer those sort of things but these were ideas more than anything else 
to get stage to the client, the, there's an opportunity here that you could bring something special to the project. So, as you can see, one of the things that we've done here is actually it's to do with the cafe and the space behind it. Actually, the lighting of those vertical surfaces within the cafe actually provide you with the part of your um, lit landscape and what you can actually see. So overall concept, um, uh, composite plan, and just some sections through the whole site. So the light, internal lighting was similar. I mean, the extension to Abercrombie, um, what we found was very important was actually that atrium space between the, two, the existing building and the new build. And actually, the fact that there was the glass bridges is actually, well, how can we enliven that space? What could we bring to it? And actually, we were looking at the bridges as an opportunity to create some visual interest. One of our original ideas was whether uh, they had uh, glowing panels to the underside. It was whether the lighting and the vertical surfaces of the balustrades. Um, and we even suggested suspending pendants within the space to create some human scale. However, it was a quite a simple scheme. Um, and it was basically, we talked about the studio spaces to adjacent to it. And actually, that will have a major impact. And they were um, just very simply lit um, using linear fluorescent sources uh, suspended. So it had provided some little bit of uplight to the soffit and um, the general functional lighting coming down. One of the reasons we throw a little bit of light up is actually so that it gives the space a lift and it doesn't feel so cave-like. The atrium itself, we also looked at the light because it's got a glazed roof. And what happens in the an atrium, they go, they can actually act as a mirror after dark. And when you look up, you see a complete reflection of what's on the floor. So one of the reasons we proposed to light the, the crown of the atrium was actually to provide minimise that uh, mirroring effect, and it doesn't look like a black hole. Um, then it was functional lighting from high level into the space using theatrical projectors. And then we're also at high level, from high level, we're also lighting the glass bridges so that it tracks, um, to create some visual interest. So that we were lighting through the glass itself and to get them to glow. So sort of like a quick sketch, picking up on the cafe area, the definition of vertical surfaces, the cafe and also it was meant to be the the portal going through into the existing building was meant to be down uh, the vertical surfaces were meant to be defined to actually allow you to see where you needed to go and then obviously from standing on one of the bridges you've got the studios to the left uh, sorry to the yeah to the left of you looking at the forum and it was a very big and complicated space and what we felt that initially what could we do in that space and actually we felt because it was so vast and it's six stories high um, from when you stand in the base is actually there's no human scale to it apart from walking around the perimeter of circulation spaces if you stand at the bottom you would see straight up six stories so we looked at whether it was appropriate to hang something in the space itself and whether there was an idea of looking at um, suspending a grid of pendants across it we also wanted to define the architectural form, so the lighting of the roof and the lighting um, and revealing certain parts of the, um, the uh, cladding so that it sat um, across the box of the lecture theatre. So in the forum space, I mean, our main concept was to highlight soffits, highlight key vertical surfaces, downlighting to simple downlighting to circulation, and then the definition of the lecture theatre, lighting to the social teaching spaces, um, and then the lighting of the main library itself, and just looking at different techniques of how we could do that. So this was sort of actually one of our final concept images of actually just talking about what we were going to do a little bit simpler and trying to reveal some of the actual materials of the building. Again, so the main reception, you've got some key, what's quite interesting is the architects using colour throughout the building to actually define certain key surfaces. 
what we've said is actually the, the lighting needs to respond to those key colors to actually help aid with wayfinding. And again, pool teaching was a very simple and robust uh, solution of just lighting the, uh, the classrooms or teaching rooms and then, the and then the lighting of the actual circulation spaces adjacent to that. What we thought was quite interesting is actually the use of daylight, especially along that western facade and the use of colored glass, that actually will allow that, um, co those corridor spaces to become very animated by day with a lot of color. And actually the lighting probably doesn't need to be on during those day, uh, when it's uh, during daylight hours. So again, the student, u uh, student union food hall, this was an area where we could have a little bit more fun. Um, and we try it because it's such a vast area, we wanted to create a sort of a layer of lighting across the space where we started looking at some very simple um, linear sources, but actually looking at the layout of them. And actually, instead of just doing it rectilinear, we started looking at overlaying them and creating some visual, uh, some pattern. So that was basically our concept. It's quite large, and it's quite long-winded, and it is quite, but the project is very convoluted in a way, um, and lots of different spaces, and we needed to have a response to each of those. The design development, which we all have to go through, is actually where we do a lot of our thinking and our development of the ideas. We worked with the architects and talked about sketch layouts, and actually we needed to look at each of the spaces. What approach did we need to do? Um, they were setting up quite a strong rectilinear grid of the building, the lighting, should it respond to it, whether it was linear sources, whether it was made up of down lights. Um, so we went through a number of series, different spaces, looked at the different options, even coming up with some sort of an I ideas for the Cafe Deli, where we ended up, this is the approach that we ended up doing, where we had quite a a random pattern on the ceiling to just break it up. Looking at how we could create some interest within the ceiling itself. So instead of just having down lights, actually whether they were recessed, so you get pockets of light instead of actually um, just simple down lights or linear sources. The lighting of roof lights just gives it more definition to the actual soffit. And coming up with some sketch details themselves, very simply, talking about principles of how we could light these spaces. So this was looking at the lighting in the forum um, and where we could locate the type of fixtures that we could use. We're looking here at looking at some theatrical fixtures or projectors to actually light those uh, spaces. One of the reasons we use or propose theatrical projectors is actually they are very good for minimizing glare um, because they ha use double lensing and you don't see the lamp source. So again, more sketch details to talk about how we could possibly power them as well. Then we end up doing the quite laborious task of lighting studies. So we ended up building very quick sketch models of each of the spaces, especially the teaching spaces, where we needed to achieve a light level. Lighting is actually one of the areas that don't actually have very many regulations. There's a lot of guidelines that most people ask you to meet, but actually there's no statutory requirements apart from emergency lighting. So we had to go through each of the teaching spaces or the architectural space, uh, the studio spaces and different things to actually check the layouts, look at the typical layouts to make sure that we're achieving the required light levels so that you could be able to work um, comfortably. So this is just a typical uh, architectural studio in Abercrombie. Then we started looking at the teaching rooms. So we also started looking at the distribution of fixtures. So this, these show sort of the polar curves or the optical distribution from the reflector and how that uh, relates down. And then you get what's known as a 3D pseudo color, which just highlights the different levels of light through the different colors. And then the library itself, this was just generically looking at the um, overall floor plate to make sure that we were getting the light, right light levels. We also did a very long and 
long study in looking at how to light the book stacks themselves or the spaces in between the book stacks so that you can actually see the book on the bottom shelf. So the argument is to make sure that the book, the actual stacks are actually aligned with the, the lighting and not sort of located with um, a, a fitting directly above it. So we end up going into schematic design, um, CAD layouts, and very simply it's just the high, um, from our point of view we end up putting on the lighting fittings, referencing them and giving them what's known as a control reference and that's how logically we want them to be controlled. So it's just grouping of lights together. Um, very simply, some simple setting out dimensions. So some of the more, uh, so that was an external space. This is an internal. And then we do schematic design details to give an idea of working with the design team, sort of ideas of actually the space required to actually incorporate lighting into details or into um, the architecture. So this is a handrail lighting detail. Um, what needs to be thought about as we develop it forward. The lighting of the bench um, within the piazza. So just whilst we hadn't specified the fixture yet, we were sort of looking at typical fixtures and sort of looking at how we would approach to get the effect that we wanted. And also to allow the engineer to start looking at it and looking at the energy consumption is actually we start doing schedules of lighting equipment. At this point, we're just talking about generic fixtures, knowing that we've done all the sort of lighting studies, so we know what wattage that we needed and everything else and the quantity, um, but we hadn't specified the exact fitting. And then, so that's design development, and then also that should have been detailed design. And so finally, you go into final layouts, which are a little bit more detailed, a lot more setting out um, fixtures. And then we end up doing installation or mounting details. So this is the lighting within the forum space and actually looking at how we can fit fixtures in between the fins on the lecture theatre um, to light the main space. And then within the specification, we end up doing full specification sheets. Um, one of the things that we did do on this project was we looked at trying to minimise uh, the number of manufacturers and the number of lamp types with on uh, lamp types on the project. And actually, one of the things that we did manage to do was that overall, on such a large project that's quite complicated, we're only using ten light uh, lamp types across the whole project, and we're only using eight manufacturers. One of the reasons we look at that and we think that it's quite an important thing to do is actually, as an end user client, they want this, the lighting scheme to be as simple as possible so that when they come to maintain it, they can maintain it as quick as possible. They don't have to think about each different room has a different light source, different things, um, so that they can actually buy in bulk and different things and make their life easier. Then going through into construction and con commissioning, whilst you think, well, we don't do very much in the construction, we actually, uh, we do at the end, we start reviewing on-site coordination issues. So there's problems on site, we end up dealing with them along with the architect and the engineer and the, the contractor. Um, and we're just giving them setting out details, marking up other people's uh, uh, drawings. Uh, this was a coordination of a detail where they, we ended up having to look at the in, um, an installation of a lighting detail at the base of the um, screen um, and looking at how we could get the best lit effect from it. Um, giving them setting out dimensions, just talking about possible problems from the screen that was going in. The fact is we wanted, they had some stiffeners which were mounted horizontally. We said, well, actually, you turn them vertical, still give you the stiffness, but actually m has l little effect on the light. Otherwise, if it was horizontal, it would stop the light going up, travelling up inside the screen and create shadowing. We also... Um, look at manufacturers' drawings or shop drawings. And one of the things that we did on this project was whilst we only used eight manufacturers, we looked at creating a fixture that could actually do the stuff that we needed to do. Whilst they're all made out of standard components, we looked at uh, different ways of doing this. We could have either gone down a route of buying everything 
straight off the peg and, and not get exactly what we wanted. But due to the quantities of the lighting on the project, it actually allowed us uh, to develop a lighting product that was actually suitable and did everything that we needed to do. So that actually when you've got volume on a project like this, it's actually quite often just as cost effective to develop a fixture itself made out of standard components, but actually then you can get the profile that you want, you can get the optics that you want. So this is one of the things that we did look at. Once the project is constructed, one of the things that we do is actually we look at the focusing of the lighting. On large projects like this, we look at um, trying to minimize the use of adjustable fixtures because obviously when you have to go and relamp, they um, can get knocked and they can be pointed in the wrong direction. So, and then the lighting effect or the li lighting looks quite poor afterwards. So we try and use them very, very sparingly. And it's something that we've learned the hard way from doing large shopping centers and uh, airports is actually, it makes the client's life a nightmare. We try and minimize their um, maintenance later on by not using them unless, we, uh, unless it's the only approach that we can do. So we ended up spending one night, um, I think it was in September, doing the focusing of the lighting in the atrium where I was stood on with the contractor on the um, movable gantry, maintenance gantry, while we pointed and focused the lighting to the base of the atrium. We also end up having to do programming schedules, and this is what we end up giving this to um, um, the controls manufacturer. And basically, this is just a schedule of how we want the lights to be controlled. The building itself is fully automated, and actually, but the lights change throughout the day. So we end up doing all these lovely schedules and looking at each space individually. We go around with the architect and snag it, uh, including, as always, making sure the defects are identified, identify what's, what was wrong, if anything has been installed incorrectly, and different things. These are obviously just some snapshots of the Abercrombie, the extension to Abercrombie, which are the stair, tower, uh, stair core teaching spaces, um, stairs, looking at some of the details, um, the interface, and then looking at how it was. This was actually taken before it was focused, but now, after dark, most of the bridges are actually are a little bit more highlighted. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. yeah. really managed to shed some light on the subject. <laughs>